Hey folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to Let's Try Gloomhaven. Now, I'm going to be gushing a little bit, because Gloomhaven, the real-life physical board game, is my absolute favorite game this year, bar none. Nothing else is really coming close to Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven's sort of like, it's like Dungeons & Dragons without a Dungeon Master, in a sense. You get the box, and it's a massive box, and it weighs 20 pounds, and it's just loaded with an incredible amount of stuff. It's, it's not a cheap box to buy, but it's really, really good value. You and your friends each control one character, and you go on the adventures through this campaign, where I think the, uh, I think the, the box version comes with 95 different adventures. There are six starting characters and a total of 17 characters. You have to, I think it's 17 anyway, you have to unlock the other characters by doing stuff while you play. You unlock items, you level up the town, you open up more adventures, um, you have a reputation that goes up and down, the town has prosperity. It's this, it's this whole thing. It's really incredible. You feel like you're adventuring this world. Each of the little uh, battle adventures don't take very long and... Um, it's really quite stupendous. So I've been waiting for this digital version uh, with a great deal of excitement. Now, this is the very first release of Early Access, and there's a lot of things from the physical board game that aren't in here yet. In particular, the true campaign mode is not unlocked. Instead, there's this adventure mode, which is the sort of procedural lightweight campaign, but still pretty darned impressive, I have to say, for the little amount that I've dabbled in it so far. The other thing is only four adventures, four characters are available um, from the start at this time. We've got the Spellweaver, the Brute, uh, the... I, I want to say rogue. No, I think I think they've got a different name, but basically the rogue assassin person. And um, oh, I don't remember his name over here. He's uh, here. We'll select him. The Cragheart. That's what he is. He's a big dude made out of rock. Uh, you have to make a lot of Thor Ragnarok references uh, if you're playing this character over here. So um, yeah. So these are the various parties that we have now. If I went back to my previous party, which was this one. Oh yeah, it still does have the XP in there. Oh, how interesting. Excellent. All right. So yeah, right now we've only got the four characters. Um, at the start of the game, you'll be choosing parties of two. So a pair of characters, but you can actually unlock the ability to have parties of three and four. I think it's quite good to only start with the two because there's going to be a good amount of stuff to deal with. The core gameplay of this are actually going to be that you're going to be playing these cards and using various abilities. Um, in the true campaign, the true board game, um, you start with these and then I think there's there's a couple of, um, of optional ones that you could sub in and out. So the spell we here can only have eight cards in her deck but I there's the ability to substitute and as you level up more cards unlock and you gain the ability to have a bigger deck and swap things in and out it's really kind of stupendous and you got items as well that you can have too anyway we're just, just going to jump into the game so again right now in the state of early access you don't have the full campaign just this sort of lightweight campaign in the adventure mode um but uh it does have the full tactical combat system which as you'll see here is kind of amazing uh three different difficulties you can choose from not only that while you are playing the game there's going to be a lot of branches that uh show up at different um different difficulties i am on a easy difficulty branch over here this sort of i started here there was a bunch of branches i could go to i went this way then from there there was a bunch of branches i could go to so i've chosen to go here i'm going to curse keep and apparently even on the way to curse keep i'm gonna have to choose i just finished the lost crypt i'm now going to choose between the armory and the cult of the bow Cult of the Bow looks like we're going to have cultists, living corpses, and bone rangers. The armory, we're just going to have bandit guards and bandit archers. Hmm, perhaps I'll go to the Cult of the Bow, because it'll we'll get to see three different kinds of enemies along the way. So yeah, this is going to be fairly easy. It's green, one skull over here. You can see the run length, two scenarios. So we're, I did the Lost Crypt, now I'm going to do one of these two, and that'll be the second scenario, and then I will reach Cursed Crypt over here. The reward for reaching Cursed Crypt will be some more gold, some more experience, as well as a Wand of Frost and a major power potion. But for now, we fight the Cult of the Bow. So we're going to go over there. Sometimes ah, you can get encounters over here. Ah, the road you are on. And again, in the real life board game, there's a giant stack of these road encounter cards. You do them some and there's usually a choice and the choice um, somehow sometimes have different different side effects depending on what members uh, what 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 characters are in your party or what your reputation is or certain achievements in your lock in the physical board game, which again should come to this digital version at some point in the future. So, the road you're on leads to a difficult cliffside path as the only route in sight to reach the bottom, you begin your descent. You notice the cliff face here has become smoother as you descend. Mysterious etchings and carvings start to emerge as you examine the walls. They begin to morph into shadows that swirl and dance about the surface, seemingly leading you along the wall to a spot on the ground. Tucked into a small alcove at the base of the wall lies an urn with a small quantity of coins inside. I can make an offering and lose some gold. I could take the gold, or I could just carry on walking. 
Let's see what happens if we make an offer. I have 97 gold right now. I have tons of money. That's that's a fortune in, in this game. Although the adventure mode might be different. I'll make an offering. Shadows dance excitedly as you make the offering before calming and fading away. You sense that your offering has not gone unnoticed. Lost 10 gold. Uh-huh. Dark infused. You have been blessed. Okay. So we'll talk about those once we get into the game here. All right. So now we have to do our adventure here. The Cult of the Bow. Maybe it's Cult of the Bow. They really like bowing. It's possible too. English is dumb. All right, and here we are in game. So you can see it sort of looks, you know, a little dungeon crawlery. Presumably we just came down these stairs over here and we are currently in this room. Our goal in this mission is very simple. All we have to do is kill all the enemies in all the rooms. So we've got some enemies in the room that we're in and then we've got a door over here that will lead to more rooms out that way. We don't know what's in there yet, which is a bit different from the board game, because in the board game you tend to know, although um, the board game does have rules for procedurally generating adventures, die rolls and various things like that, and I think in those cases the what's in the other rooms is actually a mystery, which is kind of interesting. So I like it, it's, you know, it's just the right amount of atmosphere. So this is a turn-based tactical combat system. You can see it's got hexes over here of various kinds, and we have two characters. So I have my brute and I have my Spellweaver. The Brute is a fairly physical, damagey dude. He starts with 12 hit points, which is the most of any of the characters there are, and he has a few extra abilities that can grant him some defenses throughout the way, like Warding Strength, which can allow him to um, gain shield against various attacks. Um, shield Bash can also shield him. Um, he does have is it Eye for an Eye. A little bit of a self-heal as well, but that's not really his thing. Um, the Spellweaver um, is a standard sort of wizardy spellcaster lots of ranged attacks decent damage dealing fairly squishy at eight hit points i believe this spell weaver has the lowest amount of damage or lowest amount of hit points of the starting four characters presented in the game as is i think in the tabletop they may actually start with only six hit points i'm not sure uh something like that you also know so the spell weaver only has eight cards over here so the way it's going to work on our turn let, let me let me make a pick of something to do and then I'll sort of explain the logic behind it. Let's say, and I'm gonna try to go fast, so I may not make the, the optimal move all the time, but we'll see. So Leaping Cleave over here, every, every one of these cards has two parts, and I'm gonna be picking two cards. I'm gonna play the top part of one card and the bottom part of another. So Leaping Cleave lets me, on the top part, make Cleaving Attack with two adjacent people. So in this picture, I'm the sort of the gray hex and the two red tiles are the ones we'll attack. So if I end up adjacent to two people like these two cultists over here, I can hit them with that leaping cleave attack. So I'm gonna think, ah, I'm gonna play the top of leaping cleave and now I have to pick another card with the plan of playing the bottom. Now, technically I don't have to lock in the top and the bottom at this point. Um, I just have to lock in the two cards. So I'm gonna have to at least move to be adjacent to them. Now, the interesting thing is I may have some cards in here that let me move the bottom of most cards is your movement so for example the bottom of overwhelming assault or even the bottom of leaping cleave for example but bottom of overwhelming assault lets me move three squares then push an enemy and do various things like that the thing is each one of these cards can also be played for a generic two-point attack and which is right there or a generic two-point move so i can really take any other card and play the bottom of it just as a generic move, which is what I'm going to do. I want to go quickly before these guys go. So I'm going to pick Provoking Roar. And what am I talking about going quickly? The initiative, the order in which people go, is determined by these numbers on their card. Provoking Roar is a 10. Leaping Cleave is a 54. I can use either one of these numbers as my initiative. In the board, in the in the physical board game, I think we always played it that it was the lowest number, but it's possible you get to pick, which is going to open up some new strategy for us in the future. Um, I'll have to double check the directions, but in here we can choose. Now the first card I pick is uh, by default locked in as my initiative. That's why the 54 is glowing and why the 54 is over here. But I can click on the 10 over here for provoking war roar. So now I'll go at a 10. I'll go early, which is what I want in this case. Now I also have to pick some cards for my spell weaver here. So she's got some pretty interesting um, possibilities for her stuff here. Um, she's got fewer cards, but a big part of the reason is she's got Reviving Aether, which will let us recover our lost cards. And we'll talk about the difference between discarding and losing a card relatively soon. I would like to open up with some sort of multi-attack as well, because there's a lot of people in the room all at the same time, and they're going to be doing some actions relatively soon. These numbers, by the way, are their hit points. So these cultists here have four hit points each. The Bone Ranger has three hit points and the living corpses have five hit points each. Um, I don't think I've got just a regular 
area of effect damage card. I think the best I can do is the fire orbs, which is actually much better because it lets me pick any three targets. You can see it's a three damage attack at a range three and it allows for three targets and gives me one point of experience for each enemy I target. It's also got that flame symbol, which we'll talk about in a second. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I'm in range of at least three people. Now, there's a chance we might go and kill one of these cultists, one or two of these cultists, I suppose is technically possible, but very unlikely that the uh, the brute come over here and actually manage us to kill them. Um, so I'm probably gonna have to be relatively close to these guys, which does make me a little bit worried as a relatively squishy caster, but what are you gonna do? Um, what I could do is go fairly slowly as my spell caster, give them a chance to maybe move forward. And the interesting thing about this game as well, um, monster AI, their behavior is very simple. They will try to attack the closest person to them. If there's ever a tie, they will attack whoever's got the lowest initiative, like whoever's going earliest. So if you go slow in a tied situation, um, you won't be attacked before your friends. Plus, um, as long as we go after the brute, brute's going to be moving forward. So, um, well, he's going to be moving over here. So distance might actually matter a bit. So I don't know. Um... I do want to be ready to move forward a bit. Probably just a generic move forward is okay. We actually don't have a good opportunity to use Impaling Eruption here, which is good at hitting a bunch of people in the line, really. It might come up. Tell you what, we'll queue that up. We'll have Fire Orbs and Impaling Eruption. We could change our mind. We could use the bottom of Fire Orbs for movement and the top of the erupting uh, Impaling Eruption, depending on how things go. So we've selected all of our cards over here. So I'm going to go ahead and end selection. And then what happens, the monster draw from their own stack of actions. Each monster has sort of their own individual pile for the actions that they will take on their turn. And depending on what kind of monster they are, they'll have very different flavors. So the cultists are going to go on a 27. They're going to move two steps and do a melee attack for one. The bone rangers are going to move two steps and do a ranged attack. It'll do two damage at a range of three. They'll only move if they need to get, if, if, they're, if they have no one in range, then they will move. If they've already got someone in range, they won't move. The other thing they'll do is if they wanna shoot someone who's adjacent to them, they will actually move away by one step because if you're using a ranged attack against someone who's next to you, you'll have disadvantage. We'll talk about what that does in a bit. Um, if someone is next to you, but you're range attacking someone else, you don't get an attack, you don't get a disadvantage. And Living Corpse is going to move one step and attack three. They're slow, but they slap pretty hard. So that's going to be the actions. You can see the order. The Brute's going to go, then all the bad guys are going to go. And then um, the Spell Weaver is going to go. I think her Brute will continue with her plan. I'm going to use the Provoking Roar as a generic move of two. I'm going to move to here. And I'll go ahead and use the top of Le Leaping Cleave to hit both these guys over here. So that's going to do three damage to each, or will it? There's a little bit of art there. We'll, we'll pay attention next time it comes up. But what happens every time you actually attack someone, you have a deck of cards that contains the modifier to the attack damage. And it's sort of like rolling, I'd say, a 20-sided die. In fact, it's very close to that because everyone, I believe, starts with a deck of 20 of these modifiers. And you can see on the Brute's character sheet over on the right, you see all the possible attack modifiers there, and the dots show you how many of those are left in your deck. So uh, what happened here, we actually drew two of our zeros. So our um, Leaping Cleave does three damage as a base. We drew a zero against one guy and a zero against the other, so we just did three damage to both, uh, which is why they have one hit point left. If we had drawn a plus one modifier, then we would have done four damage to that dude, and he would have died. Conceivably, we could have drawn two plus ones and killed them both. There's also a, a complete miss. There's also times two uh, in the deck, which are there for critical hits. And one of the cool things that happens when your character levels up, there's systems where you can actually change which cards are in this attack modifier deck. You can remove minus ones. You can add an extra plus two. You can, there's a bunch of other things too with um, elemental effects, which we'll talk about uh, probably when we get to the uh, spell weaver's turn. So now they're gonna go and attack. So two dudes are gonna try to attack the brute. Now these are attacking with a base of one. They also have a modifier deck that they're drawing from. They actually both drew minus ones. Now here, this guy actually did fairly well because this was a two damage attack, but he's hitting us for four. Um, can't actually see which one of the cards he technically drew. Oh, he drew the plus two because it's grayed out. Either the plus two or the times two could have been picked up. So it's supposed to be a two, plus two. So now my brute's supposed to take four damage. Now he has 12 hit points, which isn't too bad. I can just take that. The other thing you can always do is burn, i.e. remove a card from your deck. This is from your hand, basically. All these cards are in my hand. I can burn one of these to reduce the damage to two. Burn cards are completely removed from the game-ish, 
put a pin in that. Uh, whereas when you normally play a card, it just gets discarded, and there are ways to gain your discards back into your hand. But lost cards or burned cards don't come back. So I have the choice. I can burn two cards from my discard pile or burn one card from my hand or take four damage. Four is quite a bit, so I think I'm going to burn one card. Um, I don't exactly know what. Maybe the grab and go. It is nice to pick up the loot, but uh, yeah, I think that's what's going to happen. We'll burn. We'll burn a grab and go. That is selected, and I've selected grab and go. Uh, I thought I had. There we go. Confirm. So grab and go has now been removed. It's in red and sort of scratched out. Um, it won't be coming back for this character. But I didn't take the four damage. Okay. So let's take a look at the battle scene here for our Spellweaver. Impaling Eruption does really good damage in a line. Um, if I could move here, if I could somehow get to here, because it's got a range of four, I could go one, two, three, four. I could hit all three of these guys with the Impaling Eruption. But the problem is I don't. I am only able to use the move of three if I use Impaling Eruption, and that won't get me close enough. Um, I don't think I can curl it around. I'm actually not sure. If I go here, I'm not, I, I don't know how the path to the primary target, you can set little waypoints, but yeah, I don't think there's a way to set three. So I think we'll just use the fire orbs and that's gonna be fine. Um, I might be overkilling these guys, but let's try to take them out of things. I'll each use the move of four. I'm gonna move to here. So to get a little closer to everything. And then I'm gonna use the fire, fire orbs over here. So it's gonna attack three damage at a range of three, and I get to pick three targets, gain one XP for each enemy targeted. See how it's got the burn icon over here? So this is gonna to go to my loss pile, not my discard pile, because it's gonna get burned. Um, and then the fire icon here is different. This is actually gonna make an element be active. We started, because of our event, we actually started with darkness invoked, which is what's over on the right here. After I finish cast my fire orbs, there'll be fire over here as well. So let's take a look at that. So yeah, I'm gonna use, oh, uh, I still have movement left, so I could keep moving, but I'm going to say I'm going to skip the rest of my movement. Um, technically, I could just use the two here, but it makes no difference. Now I'm going to use my fire orbs. Uh, you can see here, it's telling me it's going to, it's expecting to do three damage. Now, I could at this point use an item or two. Uh, one thing is, I do have a hawk helm, which if I use it, um, I tap this, uh, I will add plus one range. So I could reach more stuff, but I can reach everything. I can also consume this minor power potion, which will give me plus one damage to my, all my attacks. Maybe, you know what, I will consume this. So that's a four damage attack. You can actually see that here. Um, I'm going to ignore these guys because I only have one left. I'm going to hit here, here, and here. If we get lucky on our draw, we might kill these guys. And even if we get a little unlucky, if we draw minus one, we'll still kill this guy. So that's not too bad. So I'm going to confirm these three targets here with the power potion. We actually drew the times two there, so I hit him for eight. There's a minus one and a plus zero. You can see it animates for just a second there. And then you can see on the side, things look a little bit different. I'm invoking fire. It's still blank right now because the invocation can't be used by my own character on the turn that he, cre he or she creates it. So if I had played fire orbs first um, and had this blank, if my second card needed to use fire, it wouldn't be able to. But as soon as I end my turn, then it will show up there. Fire and darkness have both been invoked. And basically, there are some abilities that players have, but also that mon monsters have, that will do different things if various things are evoked. Now, or e invoked, I guess they say. Now, I hit end turn here. You can see there's a little half line now. These are wearing out. They're still there right now, but at the end of this turn, these will go away completely. So they, it appears on the turn you cast it. It goes to the, the sort of... You know, it's fading away on the following turn, and then it's gone the next one. So this is the last turn. We don't have the skeleton in our turn anymore. Notice that he, lost, that he dropped some gold. Everyone you kill drops a loot token, and if you end your movement on it, not walk through, but actually end and stay there, at the end of your turn, if you're standing on a loot tile, you pick up the loot token. Um, and depending on what difficulty you're on in, in the game, loot tokens are worth varying about money. I think here, loot will be worth two gold, everyone I pick up. Um, so... Still, you know, close to these guys. We got these guys. I can do tramples. I can do a sweeping blow. Um, I've got the spare dagger for a range thing too, but only if I play the top part of that. Warring strength's pretty nice to load up, but I think I'd, I'd like to just kill some dudes right now. So I think we actually will prep a sweeping blow. And again, I think I'd like to go fairly early. So maybe play the bottom of one of these higher up cards. We don't need a heal. 
Um, I guess I could queue up the spare dagger just in case my main attack misses on someone. But I think what we'll do is we'll take the opportunity to actually use the bottom of Warding Strength here. And I'll try to go a little earlier on a 32. That might not be fast enough, but we'll see. And then our Spell Weaver here. Um, now that we have Fire Invoked, I could consume the fire with flame strike and if I do so it will add a wound to someone so they'll be taking damage over time um, freeze Nova can consume cold uh, frost armor can generate cold um, mana bolt here consumes one of any element to do an extra damage and generate it some XP for us I think I actually will mana bolt and maybe just prep the frost armor alternatively I might I could walk with the frost armor to here Anyway, I'll save the Frost Armor. I'll use the bottom of Freeze Nova's generic move to stand on the loot. Yeah, I kind of like that. Cultists are going to go on a 10. Wow. And then... Oh, and they're... Ooh. Okay, this is going to change our plans. The Cultists, on their turn, are going to move one step, if, if needed. They won't have to, to get into melee range. They will attack of zero. Remember, they still get to draw a card. They might get a plus one. They might actually do some damage. But the big thing is, this turn... If you kill a cultist, it will explode and hit everyone adjacent to it with a three damage attack. Now, if I kill the cultist before that happens, I don't think the explosion will happen. So the question now is, would I like to kill a dude, kill a cultist with a spell weaver first? What is, um, what is our Brute going to do? He's going to go after the Cultists. So the Cultists have their Explosion prep before the Brute goes. So the Sweeping Blow might not be so great. Um, the Warding Strength, I wonder if it'll push them before they detonate. I'm not sure. The thing is, though, the Brute could just walk up here and attack this guy. Um, I think I'm just going to focus on killing the corpses. Yeah, anyway, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to use the bottom of this one as a generic move. I'm going to move on to the gold pile here, the loot. And then I'll use the top of this, and uh, I do have to click and select an element. So let's consume the darkness. There we go, so darkness will go down. And I'm going to attack this guy. He's got two hit points as a three-point attack. Oh, I drew the minus two card, so I only did one point of damage. That is really unfortunate. Now, if I was worried about getting attacked... I could turn invisible here. So if I use this, um, you can see the little X over there. This card will become lost, as opposed to the Hawk Helm, which will be tapped. Um, cards that are tapped, untap when you take a long rest. And we'll look at rests in a, in a few here. Um, I'm not too worried about it being attacked at this point. I'm just going to end my turn where it is. So the cultists are going to attempt to go. I'll take the one damage. So he rolled a plus one. This guy got a plus zero, so no damage there. These guys are primed to detonate, though. So what I'm going to do... I guess I'm going to have to use the Sweeping Blow bottom for movement. I'm just going to move to here. I'm I'm going to skip the rest of the movement. I guess I do have it more, but... Um, I don't know, maybe I'll go here. I might be able to set up a better Sweeping Blow. And then I'm not going to push anyone. I suppose I could push this guy away, but I don't think there's much point. I'm just going to skip the push. Then I'm going to use the Warding Strength over here and just attack this Brute for three. He's only got one hit point left. I drew a minus two, but he still died. What a great way to burn off our minus two, though. I'm really happy. So I don't have one in the deck. If you ever, whenever you draw the times two or the flat out zero for miss, um, you do reshuffle your, your cards. Um, I'm going to just receive the damage. I'm full health right now. I don't really want to lose too many cards. Um, and I think we're going to be able to do better. Okay, new turn over here. Brute has no AoEs whatsoever. Um, and you don't anymore either. Notice how Ride the Wind has a loot ability. This lets you loot all gold within a radius of one where you are, uh, which is kind of handy. Now, in the actual board game, gold is managed for each character. Here, it looks like it's party gold. Um, and I mean, this is a single player game right now, so I guess it doesn't matter which one we do. Uh, prepping a Frost Armor might not be bad. How about I do that and just play the top of Frost Strike or Flame Strike to hit this guy? So we'll do this. And over here, I could just kill these guys with a trample, maybe. Because, yeah, that might be my, my best AoE. Um, I'll try to move faster. 
I'm gonna use the bottom of the trample, so sort of the top of something else. Um, yeah, let me use the spare dagger. I'm hoping I'm gonna move faster than the cultists. There you go, 31 and 66. Again, they have a set deck, so they're probably not gonna draw another 10 right away. They probably only have the one 10 that's in there. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to use the bottom of Frost Armor here. Next two sources of damage to you suffer no damage instead. I'll also get a point of XP for each one of those ticks of damage that come in. And it's going to channel cold. But then we're just going to Flame Strike this guy. It is at range. So because it's I'm attacking someone who's adjacent to me with a range attack, you can see the little cross swords icon that's blinking above his head. I'll be at disadvantage. I'm going to be drawing two cards from my deck of modifiers and have to use the worst one. But he's only got one hit point left. So unless I draw a pure out miss, he did. And he did. And then we've got Frost Armor over here. Um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and try the Trample move. So I'm going to move here, here. Um, and maybe I'll just stop. Oh, no, I can't. I can't stop there. I was going to say stop there to pick up the gold, but I can't. So I'm just going to swing around back this way to get closer to the door. So it's a bit of an odd move, but I'll run through the, all these guys. Doom, 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 doom. This move has the jump. Jump allows you to move through obstacles and enemies. You can always move through your allies. Jump allows you to move through obstacles and enemies. And yes, these guys are getting attacked. Boom. There's also a fly move, which is similar to jump, but actually allows you to end your move on obstacles. Um, and then yeah, I don't need to spare dagger or anything. Like, there's nothing to attack, so we'll be skipping that attack. Ending the brute's turn and ending the entirety of the round. So, uh, okay, we're halfway done. So on this scenario, I'm assuming there's only one more room and it'll have about the same amount of stuff. So the question is, what do we want to do about that right away? Well, I think the brute is going to run through the door and, um, so we're going to run through the door with Overwhelming Assault, and then we'll probably throw an Eye for an Eye with Retaliation. Something like that. Meanwhile, the Spellweaver is going to go later, and the Spellweaver is going to use the bottom of Reviving Aether, and probably the top of Ride the Wind to loot. And that'll be the last of our cards in our hand. Then we'll look at how we re recover them. Well, it's short resting and long resting. But we're going to do this this turn. We're just going to do some looting. Hopefully the Brute's going to be okay in the room on his own. This leads to funny behavior when you've got your, you know, actual other human players in the game. And you're like, why are you not helping me? But the other interesting thing about um, this game in real life is that each player on each scenario here, each adventure, gets a secret objective. The objective might be the first person to kill someone, the first person to open a door. It might be to have a certain amount of loot. It might be not to use any items and various things. And completing those earns you sort of milestones towards unlocking new perks for your characters, which is quite nice. Um, so there's always this little dynamic of like, okay, this person just did something odd, probably for a reason, but maybe still screwed me, which is really great. And I'm looking forward to that in the game. So yeah, the Brute's going to come over here and open this door. Now, here's the thing. These guys do get their initiative. If um, if I'd open the door really late in the turn, all these guys, they're going to 31, 31, 34, 34. Wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. Bone Ranger Elite. Ooh. Oh, okay. They're the same because there's Cultists and Elite versions of the Cultists. There's Bone Ranger and the Elite version of the Bone Ranger here. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. If... if if I had gone later, let's say I'd gone on a 50 and opened the door and these guys had their 30s here, they would actually get to take their turn right away. You don't get to skip their turns, which is too bad. Now, Retaliate's not really going to do anything here, unfortunately. I mean, we'll use it anyway because we got nothing else going on. Um, because Retaliate's only going to work in melee and these guys are... Well, the Cultists might run up and attack us. Cultists are going to move one and then heal someone at range, which is actually going to be fine because it's not going to do anything this turn, which is nice. The Rangers are going to go ahead and move and shoot, but, you know can't win them all so yeah he's just gonna move fail to heal anyone he's still doing the animation oh there's another dude back there mmm he can't reach yeah there, there's nothing okay that's good there's the elite like how they have different models oh that's a lot of damage yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna burn a card we'll burn the shield bash unfortunately but yeah four damage is a lot I mean, really, you know, as long as you still have one hit point left is okay, but I, I usually try to block the really high damage attacks like that. 
And yeah, so this guy's taking all this beating, and we're like, oh, hey, listen, I'm just gonna sit here and loot. Is that cool? Um, you know, I'll go here. At least I'll be closer for what comes next. I'll move there. I'll still do the loot action. Uh, oh, yeah, skip the rest of the movement. Go ahead and loot in the AoE. And the turn, and the round. Okay, so, new round. Now, notice the Brute has no cards for me to choose from. So there's two possibilities here. Either I can short rest. This will lose... So these are my discarded cards. These are my lost cards. With a short rest, a random discarded card will be lost. But then I'll get the others back in my hand. Um, and I still get to act this turn. A long rest, I still have to lose one of these discarded cards, but I get to choose which one it is. I also heal two hit points. However, this is my entire turn. It just sets my initiative to 99, and I don't get to do anything. I think this would be a poor time for a long rest. Or th the thing to say about a long rest as well is if you had any tapped items over here, then they would untap. But I'm just going to short rest. What's this over here? Oh, yes, the healing potion. I'll short rest. So it picks a card at random. It's going to be sweeping blow. I can redraw. If I don't want to lose this one, I can redraw by dealing one damage to myself, and I'll lose something else instead. And it's guaranteed not to lose the same card. Um, and while this is nice, I will accept burning this, because I got lots of nice cards. Okay, so now I've got my cards back, which is great. Uh, ditto over here with my Spellweaver. I have to choose what I'm going to do over here. Uh, I think I'm just going to short rest as well. Now, there is a card. Okay, Flaming Strike. Yeah, I'll accept it. Um... I, if it had been um, reviving ether, I would have taken a point of damage to redraw because the spellweaver only starts with eight cards. So very quickly, at some point, the spellweaver will run out of cards because you don't get these back. If ever you get to the point where you simply cannot play two cards in your turn, like you can't rest because you don't have enough left or anything like that, if you cannot do it, your character becomes exhausted and is just removed from the game. It's exactly the same as if you took, you know, you went down to zero hit points, you become exhausted. You're not perma killed. Um, but you're removed from this particular adventure. So this is the same as running out of hit points. But despite only having eight, we have Reviving Aether, which will let us regain all of our lost cards. So um, I would have re-rolled for that. All right, meanwhile, we've got a fairly scary room over here. There's a nice line here. I'm going to set up here. Oh, this is quite late. They might move again, but they might still be in a good position. I was going to set up an Impaling Eruption and hope that we can get a really good damage from that. Um, and I'm going to combine it with Ride the Wind. So I'll play the top of this and the bottom of Ride to Win, which gets me to move up to eight as a jump. So I can move through things and all that kind of jazz. Notice we got a trap over here on our difficulty setting. It would do two damage to us to move through a trap. Jumping avoids them, though. But if you try to walk through them or you end your turn on them, you're going to take trap damage. Uh, so the Brute, meanwhile, might want to set up a Warding Strength. Now that's the bottom of a card, which is a bit annoying. I don't want to leap and cleave these two guys over here. Um, I'd like to go quick and hope that I can actually kill this dude. Maybe what I'll do is I'll put Provoking Roar in here just to use it as a movement. I'll use the, the bottom of it as a generic movement, and then I get to start at a 10. All right. Move, attacks. Ooh, Cultist is going to summon some living bones. They both are. It's going to do damage to themselves, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm going to use this as a move. I'm going to go over here. And then I'll do a Leaping Cleave, hitting both these guys. A plus one on the Cultist. Uh, and I think a plus one on the Bone as well, because that's the only reason he died. Yeah. Right, I can, I can always self-heal. I could do it now. I am down three hit points. But I'll wait until it's a little bit more um, critical, because there's other ways to heal. Five damage. Yeah, we're going to burn a card for that. Um... I don't want to keep the overwhelming assault. I think I'll lose an eye for an eye. Dang. Okay. Alright, he did self-damage. Self-damage and do that. But now we got more shit to deal with, because I wasn't able to kill these things. Okay, there are some fairly decent lines. Um, actually, was that a treasure chest back here? Ooh, it is. That is tempting. But, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ride the wind to right over here. And then I can do an erupt, impaling eruption to this guy, hitting all of them in a line. So it's a base three damage. It'll also generate one, um, one I don't know, nature 
element. Um, and uh, it'll deal, it'll generate four XP for me, which is quite huge. I will have disadvantage against attacking this guy because I am adjacent to him, uh, but the rest it won't apply to that. Boom. All right, not bad. Yeah. Would like to see more things dead, I suppose, but it's not too shabby. Uh, all right, new turn. So I'm going to use Overwhelming Assault against this guy, I think, for the six damage and the XP. Um, I think I'll use the Spare Dagger as a generic move here. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. We could revive the Aether this turn. We have four lost cards. I guess we may as well. Neither one... Uh, we could use the bottom of Freezing Nova first. But it's it's a four-point heal, which is a lot. But I don't really need it. Uh, if I play the top of this and the bottom of... Oh, I guess it's just going to be a heal. Unless I just play this, I jump over here and drop a Mana Bolt. Maybe I'll do that. You know, I think that's going to be okay. We will go for that treasure chest after all. So if I jump to here, yeah, I'll have... That, this is just an obstacle. It doesn't block line of sight. So we'll jump to there. Skip the rest of the movement. Uh, oop. Uh, undo. I'm going to choose to consume an element. Thank you very much. And attack this guy. We only got one hit point, And we rolled a plus one. But still. Hey, one last target. Done. Gain ten gold. That, that's what is in the chest. Sometimes you get items in the in the campaign. So there's items that you sometimes get directly. Sometimes you just unlock a blueprint for items now you can buy from town, which is really cool. Sometimes you unlock new scenarios. There's all kinds of different stuff. I'm going to take the two damage. All right, meanwhile... Yeah, and he hasn't even gone yet. We might just be able to kill him. So yeah, I'm going to play the bottom of this card as a move. Oh, I can't reach you. Dang it. Cause, uh, two, yeah, because the obstacle. I was thinking I could just move there, but no, because it's not a jump. Um, but I have my Boots of Striding, so I can add plus two. So if I go and use the, this, activate the Boots, there we go. Now I can move to here, thanks to my Boots. And then I can use the Overwhelming Assault. Uh, yes, we will skip the rest of the movement. Overwhelming Assault to hit this guy. So it's a base six attack. It'll burn the card. I got a plus zero card, which is fine. It'll burn the card, but also give me two XP. And end the round. And that's the thing. Even if you lose a scenario, you can still accumulate... You actually get more experience from your cards, usually, than anything else. Okay. Um, the Brute is now, once again, out of cards. Is going to have to do some sort of rest. Um, we only have... We have very few discard stuff left. Everyone's kind of low. I feel like I am just going to short rest here to keep the action going. We'll lose Spare Dagger. Sure, fine. And then on my turn, I would like to hit this guy and hopefully kill him before he does anything else. Can we do that? We'll activate the um, the Warding Strength too. It's a little late, but what the heck, right? Uh, meanwhile, over here... Right. Um, I'm going to... Long rest. Well. No, okay, I'll short rest. But if we get reviving ether, I'll take damage. So it's 50-50 to take a point of damage. I guess that's fine. All right, I'll burn the mana bolt. It's going to have to be okay. And I'm going to be playing reviving elixir and frozen nova. Because those are the only two cards I've got. So I'm very low on cards. Probably haven't done a very good job managing my stuff. Living bones are going to stand still. Attempt a melee attack. And they'll actually try to hit two people with it. Then they're going to heal themselves. The cultist, meanwhile, wants to summon more living bones, which I'd rather not have him do. So, yeah, I'll just, um, and a provoking roar to hit this guy. Two damage. Also disarms, which means he can't melee attack, or he can't attack. It's not going to matter, though, because he's not actually trying to attack. Ah, I got a minus one. I needed a plus one. Um, I could move and land onto the gold. You know what? We're not going to take much more damage. I actually will do that. Because when, the scenario will end when everyone is dead. Um, so... We kind of want to grab the, the gold while we can. So I'll just end the turn here. Um, if I didn't reviving ether... Okay, yeah, so these guys are trying to attack, and then they're going to heal themselves. Very annoying. If I didn't reviving ether, I could jump and then try to, you know, kill this guy before he summons something. Right? One, two, three, four as a jump. 
and then attack here. The problem is I really do need to get my cards back. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead, reviving Aether. So all my lost cards are back. And then i got to use the bottom of this card. Um, I could use it to drop a heal, but I really don't think we need to. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to move forward a little bit to make it easier to be in range for next turn. He kills himself to summon another skeleton. And you're going to long rest here. Mostly to buy more time, because long rest, we, we're not even going to play a card this turn. So it means he's going to sort of stick around longer and hopefully just absorb some damage. And meanwhile, we're going to use f uh, not flame strike, fire orbs. Uh, I will have to move to be in range of all three, because this guy's four tiles away. So I will have to use um, the bottom of another card as a move. I guess I'll just use the bottom of mana bolt and make sure to use that for my initiative too. So it'll go faster. Moon's going to 45. We're going to try to attack a couple of people. Um, yes, so move if i move to here i'll actually be in range of all three one two three. yeah and i get to pick up some gold so that sounds good we'll do that then we'll fire orb one two three a plus one a minus one and another minus one over there depending with these guys being not quite dead at least they're not doing a heal this turn yeah you're melee him because he's closer which is great. He's got the most hit points, plus he's going to heal two on his turn. I will simply receive the damage here. Okay, good thing, because if he hit me for a lot, I would have had to still trash a card. Um, and I got to select an ability to lose. Oh, uh, yeah, your turn's over. Oh, it's still animating. Um, so, I guess the Brute is going to do Warding Strength and Leaping Cleave, since those are only two cards. And, um, we're going to do... To try to go a little faster, we'll go Flame Strike, Impaling Eruption. And it's mostly the Impaling Eruption that I'm eager to do, because these guys are in a line. I'm going to try to kill more people. Alright, he's going to 45. So... We'll start with the Cleave, and yeah, we're going to try to hit these two, because these two are in a line. Confirm Targets plus one and something else i think it was another plus one actually so they're both dead um i'll activate this not that it's actually gonna matter it would have been nice to get the xp out of this which is why normally you, you cast that quite early and uh yeah i guess what i'll do here is i'll actually just use the flame strike oh it's a ranger two so i'm gonna have to move up first um anyway i can get treasure yeah Hang on, yes, because undo. I'll use the bottom of this to move to either one of these treasures. I guess this one, because I don't want to be adjacent. So I'll pick up that treasure. Skip the rest of the movement. Activate that. Hit you. Boom. Plus two we got there for five damage. We didn't need it, but okay. And the turn, which is going to let me pick up the money. And end round, and this will be the end of the combat now, once I end the round. So those two pieces of loot I'm not going to be able to pick up. It's an interesting sort of time thing. How do you work it? So there you go. Bit of a stat screen over here. Did I not consume any potions? I did. I used a power potion, didn't I? So I think it just wasn't represented there. And uh, so that was the Cult of the Bow. So now we can travel to Curse Keep, which should not be another encounter, but instead be some loot. Enter the village. Gain 6 gold, 15 XP, a Wand of Frost. During your turn, create ice. During your attack, add plus 2 attack the entire action. Uh, oh, durability. That's interesting. So this is not a mechanic in the board game. That's what these icons are. This is, I guess, how many times you can use them. All right. Oh, we got some level up, too. So we'll put the Wand of Frost in the Spellweaver, because the Spellweaver... Um, it has something else that generates frost, but has a few things that can consume stuff, so that's going to be okay. And yeah, we have another potion. Oh, look at that. So minor healing potions are just, will never run out, but not this one, but this one would. Okay, so I have infinite ones, and then there's a major power for plus two. Minor power. So place the minor power with a major. Maybe I'll keep you with a heal. Oh, 
it's turning red. Can I? Oh, hello. Oh, we can buy more stuff. Oh, okay. I can buy another uh, Hawk Helm. Oh, it's also letting me sell stuff here. Nice. Okay, this is just everything. All right. A Mask of Terror. During your melee attack, add push one. Eh, maybe. The Hawk Helm was really nice, though. So, I would like to buy a Hawk Helm. Can I buy two? Yes, please. Because I certainly want you to have it. Now, the Brute... Now, I don't know if this is like six uses or six total encounters. I think it's six total encounters. So the Brute, I'm going to leave the Hawk Helm off of him. Because he doesn't really do that much range stuff. That's sold out there. I suppose I could get him the Mask of Terror, but we're not doing that kind of pushing. Um, so that's it. That's the shop that's in this town. So we could leave here, and then there you go. We've got some paths again. I could walk back over this way. It'll actually be medium sets of encounters. You can see this, the rewards. Boots of Striding, Wand of Brilliance, Amulet of Life. I'm going to Burn Taverns, considered hard. 40 gold, 44 XP. Yeah, but there's also level up. Can I? How do I level up? I need to know. Oh, there's a button here. Ha ha! Choose a card. Uh, so th okay. Ooh, range three, big AOE, big heal as well. Hardened spikes, self and adjacent allies. Move three shield. Move this flaming burst or flashing burst. It's very mobile. I like this character's mobile. My in when we play Gloomhaven, I actually play the Tinker, who's not terribly mobile. He's nice though. Good utility person. Um, lots of control, lots of AOEs, and lots and lots of heals, which is mostly how I play him in my group. Um, I'm kind of tempted by this Icy Blast card. Let's do that. So, so that's how they're doing it. So now I've added an extra card here. It's a little different than the board game, but kind of cool. Um, level up here too. We can get the Juggernaut. And next three sources of damage suffer no damage instead. Lots of XP. A move and attack. It's rare to get moves on top. Fatal Advance just insta-kills one normal enemy. <sighs> Wall of Doom. And that's cool. It does burn itself. Most things that generate XP burn themselves. I kind of like the Juggernaut. Because this, this non-burning move and attack is good. And the bottom part's really strong as well. I'm going to go Fatal Advance, and the reason is that if I go higher difficulty, people will have more hit points, but they will, you know, still die to Fatal Advance, which seems pretty good. So I'm going to end the video here. Hopefully you got a good flavor of how this game kind of works. And again, hopefully I've sold you on the idea. I think this is my ultimate goal for this adventure, is to go here and, and defeat this or something like that. Um, or maybe it's just something I know about. That's possible, too. Uh, I, I haven't played too much in the adventure mode here. Again, this just came out in early access. Um, the, the, I, I'm in love with the physical board game and really looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the modes getting added in here. This adventure mode actually seems pretty amazing, but I'm really looking forward to the campaign mode because it's sick. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.